Okay, so the first thing today is, is you have a homework two for me. Make sure you put your name in the section number, Johnson City, your 521, here your 531. Um, you'll get your one, homework one back at the end of class today. Rob's got them, I got them. I've already emailed them back to everybody there. So we're going to pick those up. You may left. Awesome. Yeah. Now, I was just making sure everybody turned in their homework. They were turning them in as they walked in the door. No, that's cool, man. I appreciate that. They're on the ball. And hopefully, if things go well tomorrow when I have to go to Asheville in the morning, I will get these back to you on Thursday. I always try to give you immediate feedback. Um, the other thing I've done is, all right, so now I'm going to show you a little D2L thing here. I'm in our D2L site under content. You know, that's where I put everything. And you'll notice down here there's homework solutions, all right? So at 7 o'clock tonight, the homework solutions for that homework that I'm going to give you back in the class will show up. So I went through and, I mean, I worked the problems, put the graphs in, did everything for you. Because when you get your homeworks back, you're going to see where I put, like, little ones and wrote some stuff and wrote little minus ones. There were 16 things I checked for out of how many problems we did. And so on the top, you'll see a number out of 16. Now, you notice I've never used the word points. I don't know at the end of the semester how many things I'm going to check and how many you're going to get right, and then we'll figure out the, out of the 250 points. It's just how many things I checked. So, for example, I click that. So when I give you a homework solution, that's what it looks like. Okay, the first four is multiple choice, little ones. You gave me the 3%. You gave me the graph. Oh, you could have gave me the bar graph, the pie chart. I'd have gave you credit for either one. And then 131, there's your histogram, and there was the things I was looking for. So, I mean, I went through and worked out the problem like the, the homework like you guys did, okay? That will show up at 7 o'clock tonight. And it's always under homework solutions. The night that I hand them back to you, they'll show up at 7 o'clock that night, okay? Um, the other thing we got going on is this. I had told you when we talked the first night that we were going to do a class survey, Actually, I checked it out. There's 14 questions that they want you to answer, okay? So where the class survey is, it's just a link for you, all right? So it's in D2L, under content, <coughs> under class survey. This is how we get some of the data for that capstone project that shows up the last month of the class. You provide some of the data for us. Most of the time, you provide almost all the data for us that we use, right? Where we're going to use many tabs to solve problems and everything. So it's going to show up tonight at 9.15, uh, the 15th at 7 o'clock, same as the homework. And you have to the 25th at, I think I set it at 11.30 p.m., the 25th of Friday. So you've got almost two weeks to go and complete this survey, okay? Now... Here's the deal. I'm content class survey. There's a link here. We click it. There's my class survey. What gender are you? How old you are in age? Did the government mandate child vaccinations? There's 14 questions, right? Take your time, answer them, because we want some good data so the lady that cleans it all up don't have to cl clean everything up. So you'll answer all 14 of them. You know, how much did you spend on your last meal? You ate an off-campus restaurant, round to the whole dollar. $15, $20, whatever in the hell it was, all right? At the bottom, you're going to click Done. That submits it. And then everybody gets collected up from all the 1530 classes, all right? What I need out of you is, I don't want to add any irrelevant data to this lady's file, but after you click Done, what I want is, we want a screenshot. after whatever page comes up after you complete the survey after you hit done whatever little picture shows up it usually comes up and tells you you have completed the survey and past semester there's been a cute little black brown lab shows up take his picture screenshot him i don't know what it is this semester but i'm hoping it's the little lab again okay <laughs> so you're going to screenshot after you complete the survey this is just going to make my life a little bit easier. So take a little picture of it that you completed, all right? You're going to upload. 
the screenshot. You do not email it to me. You're going to upload the screenshot to D2L. There is a Dropbox, and it's titled Class Survey Screenshot. Okay, so after you hit the little done, there'll be, a, there'll be something pop up there at SurveyMonkey where this is. You'll take a little screenshot. It says you completed it or the little doggy, whatever it is, all right? Whatever you see after that, take a screenshot of it. And then you're going to upload that screenshot to D2L. There's a Dropbox cl titled Class Survey Screenshot. Now, I don't need that guy. I'm back into your little D2L site. The way I do it is evaluation. Dropbox. That's where the Dropbox is. The same place assessments and grades. It's under evaluation. All right. You'll click the Dropbox. The Dropbox is going to be there till the 25th, and you'll just upload that screenshot to there. Now, if you'll play this game, it's a game. Take the little survey, answer the 14 questions the best you can. All right. Upload the little screenshot here. All this crap here is worth five points. Now notice that's a bonus though. So remember we're based off a thousand point scale. You'll give, I'll give you five points. I see a screenshot from you there. You got till the 25th to complete it. I don't think it's asking for a lot to you know, take a little bit of time, answer 14 questions so we can get some data on you folks that uh, we can use later for the, the capstone project. All right. Everybody understand what's going to happen here. This didn't get emailed to me. That screenshot got uploaded. All right. All the links, the, everything you need is there. There's your little thing. You'll upload it. Again, the class survey is under content. When you go in, it looks like this. It'll show up at 7 o'clock, answer it, screenshot, upload, done. I'll eventually give you five points for it Okay, as a little bonus for doing that for me. Okay. All right, so here's where we're at in the book. We're in chapter three. What we had just talked about last Thursday, we talked about the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, one, two, or three away, and we talked about percentages between them. The last thing I talked to you about was what happened to your summary statistics when you start adding the same number to all the values, all the data point, all the individuals, right? Did we slide? What happens if we multiply? Did we reshape it? Did we change everything then? That's the last thing I wrote up for you on Thursday. Now, the reason I talked about that is because here's the thing. The rest of this chapter is you're going to have a normal distribution. In other words, you're going to have a normal density curve, symmetric, single-peaked, and bell-shaped. The variables that we're going to look at are going to be told to you as they have a normal distribution. Their distribution is described by one of these normal curves, one of these normal density curves. And what I'm interested in is areas under a curve, right? between values, to the left of a value, to the right of a value, because those areas represent proportions or percentages of observations. Okay. Now remember, there is a different normal distribution, a different normal curve for every mean and standard deviation, every mean, mu, and every standard deviation sigma somebody could give me here. Agreed? Because remember, that's the two most important things you can tell me about a normal distribution, the mean mu and the standard deviation sigma. All right? So... Instead of having a table for every possible normal distribution that we would ever see, we're going to convert it all to one normal distribution. And the normal distribution we want to work with and that we have a table for for finding areas under this curve is called the standard normal distribution. Now look, folks, once I get going on this, this one ain't going away. Anytime we talk about a normal distribution in this class, whether it's this chapter, whether it's about probability, or whether it's those ending chapters, the standard normal distribution always comes back to us. Okay? Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Okay? All 
normal distributions that means anyone you're looking at are the same if we measure okay in units of size Yeah, that's sigma. That's your standard deviation that's given to us about the mean mu. So instead of saying that, you know, your, your variable is measured in inches, and this particular value is 6 inches to the left of the mean, we're going to measure the number of standard deviations an observation is from the mean. Have I already done this to you? 68 is 1 away, 95 is 2 away, 99.7 is 3 standard deviations away. I've already done that kind of stuff to you. It's just we didn't make a big deal out of it, right? But we can do this for any value of the variable by telling somebody how many standard deviations away from the mean that particular observation is, all right? Now, this little move here of measuring in terms of the number of standard deviations and observations away, this is called standardizing that's about the only time I get that term standardizing ends right here at the beginning of all this so I'm on page 85 in your book all right and there must be a little formula here that does this it says, if x is any observation from a distribution that has a mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma, it's normal, right? It's got a mean, mu, and a standard deviation sigma. The standardized value of, of, of x is this. So when they think about this standardized value, our formula is, look, that's a z. I always put a line through the z so you don't think it's a 2 is given to you by x minus mu. So that's a value of the variable you're trying to standardize. It's the value of the variable you're trying to tell me how many standard deviations away from the mean it is. x minus mu, and then we divide by sigma. Now, I, I don't care how you want to think about that, but when you think about a value of the variable and you subtract the mean from it, that's a distance, right? And then as soon as you divide by sigma, you're saying, well, okay, how many standard deviations away from the mean is a particular observation? That's a standardized value. That is a z-score. That's what you'll hear out of my mouth here is, yes, it's a standardized value. It's this idea of standardizing. It's this idea of measuring in terms of the number of standard deviations away from the mean and observation is. Folks, it's a z-score. You've got to get used to that out of my mouth now. It's a z-score. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these normal distributions, and I'm going to show you how to calculate this before we start using this. All right? So we can take a look at example 3.4. Uh, I'm kind of interested in how I read this here. What I find is important out of all the language. It says, the height of women aged 20 to 29 in the United States are approximately normal. What's approximately mean? It looks like a normal distribution to us. Its mean mu is 64.2, and its standard deviation sigma is 2.8. So I have a normal distribution with a mean of 64.2 and a standard deviation of 2.8. It turns out we're, the variable we're talking about is the heights or the heights of young of women aged 20 to 29 here. It turns out those heights follow a normal distribution that is centered at a mean of 64.2 inches and has a standard deviation of 2.8 inches, right? That's what this has given me. Now, let's do this. Let's say, let, what is the standardized V 
value of a height. Now look, the book's used as 70. I want to do something different. I don't want to be just like the book. What is the standardized value of a height of 63 inches? Now look, I don't care what's going on there. What I'm asking you is, is how many standard deviations away from the mean is 63 inches? A height, a woman's height of 63 inches. How far is it away? Okay. So if I'm going to do that, I just gave you a value of the variable. I gave you a height, 63 inches. That's the height of some somebody here. I want to know what is the z-score corresponding to that? What is the standardized value? So I'm going to take my formula. And look, I always say the same thing as I am writing here. There's a value of the variable that you're trying to standardize here. There's a value of the variable that you are interested in. You are interested in 63. So you're going to take 63 minus the mean, 64.2, and you're going to divide by the standard deviation. So you're going to take 63 minus 64.2 and divide by... We're going to need a calculator because we're not going to read that one out of the book. Anybody got one? What is 63 minus 64.2 and then divide by 2.8? Negative 0.43. Now, when I write down a z-score for you, I always give you two decimal places. I have a reason for that. It's always, if there was a number out there, I'd have put the number, but it's always point in two decimal places. The minus is telling you what here? That 63 is to the left or smaller than 64 and point 0.2, right? You're to the left. Yeah? The point 0.43 is telling you how many standard deviations to the left you are. You are point 0.43 standard deviations to the left or smaller than the mean. Right? That's what it's telling you. The sign is telling you the direction. Minus means you're to the left or smaller. Positive is going to be to the right or bigger. The number is telling you how many standard deviations that way you are. Now, let's do another one. Let's try a height of 72 inches. We got a tall girl. So if I want to try this, I want to find the z-score. I want to tell you how many standard deviations away from the mean 72 is. So I'm going to find the z, 72, the value of the variable you're trying to standardize, find the z-score you're interested in, minus your mean, and you're going to divide by your standard deviation. 2.2. 7, 8. Again, always two decimal places, right? 0.78. Now, the plus, right? The plus is telling you that 72 is to the right of the mean or greater. The 2.78 is telling me 72 is 2.78 standard deviations greater than the mean. Now, look, I can't help it. I have that number line in front of us again. The mean is sitting here. 64.2 is sitting here. 72 is out here, right? It's to the right or it's greater. 63 is to the left or it is smaller. The standard, look, the standardized value, the z-score always tells you two things. There's going to be a plus or minus sign. Minus sign means that value is smaller or to the left, right? Positive sign means it's greater or it is to the right. The number's telling you how many standard deviations that direction you are. Now, look. The number is the important thing. The minus or the plus is to make sure you don't screw it up. See, if you're trying to standardize 63 here and 63 is to the left of the mean and you get a z-score that's positive, you screwed something up. Or if you're trying to standardize 72 and 72 is to the right of mean and you get a negative z-score, you screwed it up. And what you screwed up is... <clears throat> You flip-flop the x and the mu. 
the number away will be correct. The problem is the sign will be off, right? Because remember, it's always z is equal to a value of the variable. That's your x. That's your variable here. There's a value there. Minus the mean of your normal distribution and divided by your standard deviation. It's always in that order. Again, if you're doing this and you know 63 is to the left and you get a positive z-score, I'm kind of thinking that you flip those. Okay? Now, here's why we want this. All right? Because this idea of standardizing, this idea of calculating z-scores, this idea of telling me how many standard deviations on either side of the mean an observation is. What we're doing is standardizing, calculating z-scores, standardizing expresses observations in a common scale. In other words, you're taking all the units out. You're not telling me how many inches or feet or weight it is, whatever the variable's values are, is measured in. It's you're telling me how many standard deviations away an observation is. So what it does is it takes any normal distribution that we have and it transforms it into what's called the standard normal distribution into a single one where z-scores live, all right? So it takes our normal distribution, and I'm sorry, but that's the one, when I say r, that's the one given in the problem. That's what I mean by the one, the, when I say it takes our normal distribution, that's the one that's given to you in the problem, into the standard normal distribution. Now, what makes the standard normal distribution so special? It's normal. So that means it's symmetric, single peaked, and bell-shaped. It has a mean of zero, and it's got a standard deviation of one. Anytime you see that you're looking at this normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, they're talking to you about the standard normal distribution. Okay? Where is this whole guy at? This whole guy here, he's on page 86 in your book. There's a little box there. So here's what went on with these heights. All right? So if we go back here for a second, I, I want to draw these two pictures for you, all right? If I go back here, and these are the heights that had a normal distribution, a mean of 64.2, and a standard deviation of 2.8. That's our distribution. That's the one that was given to me in example 3.4, right? That's the heights of women aged 20 to 29. Remember, its mean is right here in the middle. Okay. Now, we were interested in two values there. Remember, we did something about 63, and we did something about 72, right? We standardized those two in that example, right? I just picked two heights to standardize. When I say it transforms this one into the standard normal, well, let me draw the standard normal one down here. This is standard normal. So you see me write that? It has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. That's the normal, that's the standard normal one. It has a mean of zero. Okay? Now, does anybody remember the two Z scores that we calculated, the two standardized value? The one for 72 was two point, what was it? 2.78. 2.78. And the one for 63 was negative 0.43, right? We did that work already. So what it did is it takes 63, 
to that z-score, that standardized value, it takes 72 to 2.78, right? And it takes the mean of 64.2 to, z, to uh, the mean of that one. That's what you did. Now, could I pick any height I wanted up here? Any woman's height? Was there anything special about 63 or 72? I could have picked any one of them, right? And I would have found a particular standardized value, a particular z-score, and it would have matched up. Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to leave in red. How do I get from the one on top to the one on the bottom? That little formula for a z-score. That's how I got there. I took 63, subtracted off the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and get that negative 0.43. I took 72, subtracted 64.2, and divided by 2.8 to get to 2.78. I could have done any value I wanted here. Now, one other thought here. You see right there, that's the x-axis, right, of your normal distribution that's given to us in the problem. Now, what lives there is x's live there. In other words, values of the variable that's given to you. Or in this case, the variable you're looking at is heights of women age 20 to 29 live on that x-axis. Now look, I'm going to take you back to last Thursday. Where in the hell did the density come, curve come from? There was some histogram running around that we smoothed out, right? On the x-axis is your variable here. So it's still the values of your variable there, and that's still your x, right? On your one given to us. Now, what lives down here? Under the standard normal on this x-axis, the z-scores live there. These are your standardized values. That's what lives there. Now look, there's a table that's going to help us here. The punchline is this. Okay. Let's say I was looking at these heights of these women, all right? And I know they follow a normal distribution. I know they have a mean of 64.2 and a standard deviation of 2.8. Let's say I want to know what percentage of women age 20 to 29 have heights less than 63 inches. In other words, I'm going to write right on this picture. I'd like to know this area here. Remember, the area represents proportions or observations that I can turn into a percentage. This takes us back to last Thursday, maybe even last Tuesday when I got started there, right? Now, am I one, two, or three standard deviations away from the mean? You ain't got to look nowhere. You are 0.43 standard deviations to the left. Are you one, two, or three away? No. Does the 65, 68, 95, 99.7 rule help? No. But we're going to have a table that we can look up areas under the standard normal curve, that standard normal distribution. Because you see this right here, this area here to the left of negative 4.43? Uh, Those two areas are equal. So if I can find the area under the standard normal to the left of minus 4.3, then I can find the area to the left of 63 in the original one normal distribution that is given to us. That's what the rest of this is all talking about. Now, before I got a problem here, okay? Page 87, top of the page. Cumulative proportions. The cumulative proportion for a value x in a distribution is the proportion of observations in the distribution that are less than or equal to x. To the left, folks. When somebody's talking to you, and the book will do this to you, when they're talking to you about a cumulative proportions. There's always your normal curve. And I don't care if it's the one given to us or the standard normal one. You have some x, and this is what they're talking about. It's the area to the left. Less than or equal to x. When we're talking about cumulative proportions, that's what they're talking about here. Now, here's what I want to do. I understand in your book there's an example, 
There's an example 3.6. There's an example 3.7. There's an example 3.8. I'm going to page 90. You can read those examples if you want. I'm going to show you how these problems operate here, right? Because what I'm going to use on you is on page 89, it says using table A. Now, table A was one of the tables that you printed out. Remember, you got formulas and tables. You printed out table A. If not, table A is somewhere here in the back of our book. Um, I'm on pages 698 and 699 in your book. There's a table A there. It's the same table A that you printed out and stuck with your book. Okay. It says using table A to find normal proportions. In other words, to find proportions under a normal curve, to find areas. It says, one, state the problem in terms of the observed variable X. Draw a picture that shows the proportion you want in terms of cumulative proportion. All right, draw yourself a picture. Write down what the question is asking you. Standardize X to restate the problem in terms of the standard normal variable Z. Standardize it to find the standardized value of the Z scores. And then we're going to run for table A to find the areas that we are trying to do. Now look, there's three types of problems here. And I don't care what your normal distribution is, there's three types of problems. We give you a value of the variable, and you find the area to the left of it, number one, the area to the right of it, number two, or number three, you find the area between two values under a normal curve. That is the three types of problems here. When the book's talking to you about working these problems, using the standard normal table, finding normal proportions, there are three types of problems. A value you want to the left, a value you want to the right, or two values and you want between. Okay? So, like I said, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. There's no need for me to do the problems that's in the book here as examples, especially not at this point. Sometimes I do. I don't want to do that here. I want to come over to page 90. We're going to practice reading the problems, pulling the information out. How do we attack this? What the hell do we do? And then eventually I'm going to use table A. And how do we read table A? All right? Okay. So I'm on page 90 here. And let's look at 3.11, okay? We're going to do a little bit of everything here. Look, I want to change the normal distribution so you see that I still do the same thing. It doesn't matter what the variable is as long as it's normal. So in 3.11, it says the summer monsoon rains in India follow approximately a normal distribution now, I have a question for you folks. If it follows a normal distribution, what are you looking for now? Now you're looking for the mean and you're looking for the standard deviation, right? It turns out they, uh, the normal distribution with a mean of 852 and a standard deviation of 82. Okay, so it's monsoon rains in India, right? They're approximately, they follow approximately normal distribution with a mean of 832 and a standard deviation of 82 millimeters. All right. I don't give a shit. That could still be the heights of women age 20 to 29. I need the normal distribution is the deal here, right? So you go to part A. In the drought year, 1987, 697 millimeters of rain fell. And what percent of years will India have 697 millimeters or less of monsoon rain? Now... You know when I just read that you need to state it in terms of the variable X? What do we want here? We want the percent. I always let X stand for whatever variable is in the problem. This time it is monsoon rains, right, the amount. I want the percentage that X is less than, what does it say, 697 millimeters or less. Less than or equal to 697. I took the question, I translated the symbols. That P means percentage, if that's what it's asking for. It also means proportion to me. It also means just find the area under the curve. All right? So now, look, when you're doing problems for yourself, you at least got to write that. 
Now, I'm going to draw pictures because that helps me show you what I'm doing. If you don't like drawing the pictures, don't draw the pictures. I'm going to draw the pictures, all right? I always start with the distribution that's given to us. Here it is. This is that normal distribution. You know I'm looking at it because I just labeled the mean was 852, right? So that's that normal distribution that was given to us in the problem. Then, whatever variable, whatever value you're looking at, I'm always going to put that on your picture here. Where does 690, I got to ask, where in the hell does 697 go? Does it go to the left of 852 or does it go to the right? Yeah, you don't even have to answer. You all know it goes to the left because I'm reading from smallest to largest here. So 697 comes here. Then once you put that on there, I always draw myself a line from the smooth curve, the density curve, down to that point on the x-axis, a straight line. For the first problem, I'm going to ask you a dumb question. Do you want to shade to the left or do you want to shade to the right? In other words, what area do you want here? What percentage, what proportion are you looking at? You see, less than or equal to, that's what the symbol's telling me to do. Look to the left. Now, first problem that we've done so far. I should ask you, are you one, two, or three away? And we could use that rule. I don't even care. Because what I got here works every time, whether you're one, two, or three away. Everybody understand that? Okay? So the next step is you got to standardize. You got to tell me how many standard deviations to the left 697 is. That means you're going to take this z score, you're going to take the value of the variable, 697, you're going to subtract off your mean, 852, and you're going to divide by your standard deviation. Remember, the standard deviation there was 82. Are we expecting a negative or a positive z-score? Look, folks, I'm expecting a negative one. You're to the left, correct? What we get here? Negative 1.89. The negative makes sense. 697 is less than 852, so it's negative. That's telling you you are 1.89 standard deviations to the left or smaller than the mean. Now, I've got to draw you another picture at this point. Because as soon as we do that, as soon as we calculate that z-score, we found the standardized, I don't know what word you want me to use. I've got to quit saying standardized value. It's the z-score, right? That's your standardized value. You immediately go from the one that was given to us to the standard normal, right? So... Now the picture I'm looking at is I try to remember to label that one so you know. Look, he's looking at the standard normal at this point. The mean is 0. The z score was negative 1.89. Whatever way you shaded here, you're going to shade same. Okay. Now, at this point, there's no magic. There's a table that comes into play, and that's your table A. Like I said, you either printed it out. It would be nice if you printed it out because we get to a test. I'm not going to let you have your book out, so you need those formulas and tables I told you to print out earlier. We come over here, and we come to, I'm going to look at the book. I'm on page 698 and 699. Now, that's all table A. The ones on the left, the z-scores are negative. 698, 699, that's the one where the z-scores are positive. Now, here's what I'm going to do for you. We're running the table A. I can't do it without it. If you'll notice, the first column, it says z, and it goes negative 3.4, negative 3.3. So it takes the whole part and then the tenth position, yes? And then across the top of the table, you see the point 0, 0, 0, 0.01, 0 0.02. That's giving you the hundreds position. So you see this minus 1.89? You are going to be in the row that's minus 1.8. And the column, which is 0.09. Right? So you've got to read down until you find minus 1.8. You've got to read across until you find 0.09. And when you do that, you're going to get a number, right? And it's four digits, right? It's, do, it's a point. Four digits. Does everybody see the 0.0294? I get that right, 0.0294?
Now, that table there is telling you areas under your standard normal distribution. And it always tells you the area to the left. Remember the cumulative? It always tells you the cumulative. It only tells you the area to the left of your z-score. The area to the left there we found was 0 0.029. Four. Yep. What they're telling me is, is this area right here is 0 0.0294. That's what we read off of table A by finding the right row, the right column, going across, going down. That's the cumulative area. That's the cumulative proportion. That's what you just found on your picture here. Now, here's the thing. If that's 0 0.0294, That's 0 0.0294. Whatever the area you're looking and you find under the standard normal, that's the area that you were looking for up here. Now, just be careful here because that's a area, right? That's a proportion. The proportion's 0 0.0294. What did the problem ask me for? The problem asked me for percent, right? So would anybody be upset if I tell you, look, the answer to my question here is, Move the decimal place two to the right. Multiply by 100. That'll turn your proportion into a percentage. I do all the problems the same. All right, I start out, work through, go to the standard normal, read the table. One more time, table A only tells you the area to the left of the z-score you're looking up. Okay. So then I come back over here. That's, that answers my problem, right? What I know is, is the question said, now I'm going to go back and read, in the drought year 1987, 697 millimeters of rain fell. In what percent of all years will India have 697 millimeters or less of monsoon rain? In 2.94% of all years, it will have 697 millimeters or less of monsoon rain. Everybody understand, right? That's what we're doing, okay? Now, I don't want to do part B yet. No, I want to go. Look, I told you there's three types of problems. A value, and then you found the area to the left. That's that one. I need one where I give you a value, and we find the area to the right. So instead of doing part B here, what we're going to do is we're going to go to problem 3.12, okay? So I moved to page 90, it's the bottom of 90 and the top of 91. Then. I like to change normal distributions on you. I like to change what variable you're looking at, all right? It says the medical college admissions test. This must be the MCAT they're talking about. Almost all medical schools in the United States require students to take the medical college admissions test, MCAT. The exam is composed of three multiple choice sections, physical science, verbal reasoning, and biological sciences. The scores on each section is converted to a 15-point scale so that your total score has a maximum value of 45. Now, everybody paying attention? Does anybody give a shit about any of that? Did anybody see the word normal and the mean is this and the standard deviation is this? We've got to read the whole thing to see what they're talking about. We're talking about MCAT tests. Okay. If these don't follow a normal distribution, we might as well just rip that shit out of the book and throw it away because we can't do anything with it. It says the total scores follow a normal distribution. No joke. Had to. And in 2013, the mean was so. These MCAT scores follow a normal distribution. The mean is 25.3. Standard deviation is 6.5. There we go. We got our normal distribution. It says there is little change in the distribution of scores from year to year. In other words, the mean and standard deviation don't change much. It might change a little bit, but you know, in 2013, there was your mean, there was your standard deviation. They follow a normal distribution. So we're not talking about women's heights. We're not talking about monsoon rains. Hell, we're talking about NCAT scores. Okay? So we go to part A. And now it says what proportion of students taking the MCAT score, MCAT, had a score over 30? Part A. Big capital P. Proportion, percentage, area. 
your variable this time is still x. It's an MCAT score. And what does it mean over 30? Yeah, I know. I know. Over 30 means greater than 30. Does that include 30? Remember, I just graded your homework over the weekend from homework one. And it seems to me like there was a question about IQ test scores. And it wanted to know what percentage was over 100. Does 100 get included? It said above 100. I apologize. Not over 100. Is above 100 include 100? Above 30 include 30? Uh -uh. Look, that's okay. I didn't count it wrong. I wrote in there 62 out of 78 instead of the 64 out of 78. Almost all of you did. And we was going to have a little talk about what does above 100 mean. That doesn't include 100. That means above 100. What does over 30 mean? That doesn't include 30. That means bigger than 30, right? No, there's no equal to there. Look, I'm not the guy to be teaching you the English language until it comes to shit like over 30 or above 100. I understand that. Other than that, eh. All right? Now, did I do the same thing here as I did in the last problem? I wrote down my normal distribution. I translated my question. Where do I go now? Now I start drawing you a picture, right? I'm going to draw you our normal distribution, the one given to us in the problem. Here sets your mean at 25.3. Do we have a value, that, and I always say it like this, do we have a value of the variable we're interested in in the problem? Yeah, it's 30, right? So I'm going to put 30 on here. Next step is I drew the line. Look, I can't even ask you which way you want to shade. You're going to shade to the right because you want greater than, right? Now, it doesn't matter that the last time you wanted to the left and this time you want to the right. I still got to standardize, right? Because I'm going to assume that you can look at this real quick and see you're not one, two, or three away. I'm not going to ask that again because I don't care. I'm just going to do the problem, right? So you standardize at this point, which means calculate a z-score. Take the value of the variable you're interested in. You're interested in 30. Subtract off your mean. Divide by your standard deviation of 6.5. Are we expecting a negative or a positive z-score? And I'm only mentioning that to you so you don't get things backwards here. It's always the variable, value of the variable, minus the mean. What did you get this time? 2 point, 1 point? 0. 0. 0.72. So I'm going to write that as 0. 0.72. In other words, 30 is 0. 0.72 standard deviations to the right or greater than the mean. Not a full standard deviation away. Okay. Okay. Where does that take me? That takes me to the standard normal. You understand my pictures don't have to be exact. It's just to give you an idea of where we're looking. Sometimes it's easier to look at the picture and see which way I'm shading. My mean here is 0. My little z-score I just found was 0 You want the area to the right before, you want the area to the right now. Okay? Now, we're running for table A at this point, right? That's what, that's what makes all this work for us. So we go to table A. Now, here's the thing about table A. This time you're going to be in the row that's 0 0.7. I'm sorry, I can't bring myself to write that 0 0.72. It's 0 0.72. There's a 0 sitting there. You're in the row of 0 0.7. And you're in the column 0.02. You're going to read across. You're going to read down. You're going to give me a number like 0.6 something or 0.7642. Now, here's the warning. What is that table? What area does that table always give you? That table always gives you the cumulative area, right? The cumulative portion. Translation, it always gives you the area to the left. It's given me this area, 0.7642. I know you want to the right. The table always tells you to the left. Now, how am I going to find this? Anybody remember the total area underneath this density curve? It is 1, right? Remember, that's what makes it a density curve. So you're going to take 1 minus your 0.7642. 
Because if there's 0. 0.7642 to the left, then there's one minus that to the right, right? Whatever's left over there. And here I should be getting, what is this, 8, 5, 3, 2. So I get 0. 0.2358. I get it wrong? Okay. So if that area is 0. 0.2358, this area is... 0.2358. If that area is 0.2358, the proportion is 0.2358. What did the question ask for? The question just asked for what proportion, right? So that is your answer here. It is 0.2358. I don't need to turn it into percent. It just asked me for the proportion, and it is the same as the area. So what this is telling you is, is 23.6% of people, students taking this test scored higher than 30, over 30, right? That's what it's telling me. Proportion, 0.2358. Okay, so a proportion of 0.2358 of the students scored 30 or over, or over 30, sorry, over 30. Now, before we do one between, right, because that's the third type. Remember, we did the first one, monsoon range to the left, this one to the right. Now, in between, let me ask you this. Suppose I changed a couple words in this question. It says, what proportion of students taking the MCAT had a score of 30 and over? In other words, does anything change here if I include 30? Does my answer change? In other words, I'm going to do this. I don't want to do it. Instead of it just being x is greater than 30, suppose it was x greater than or equal to 30, does anything change? Nah. Anything I want to do change? Does my answer change? Nah. Whether 30 is in the problem or 30 is out of the problem, it doesn't change here. Same way with the previous problem. We included the 697. If it had said less than 697, I'd have still got the same answer. So whether that little point, that, that little value you're looking at is included or not does not change what I do. Right? I still do the same thing. You understand we're looking at the area under the curve, right? So whether I throw that line in or I don't, does that change the area? Does the line have area? Nope. Oh, right? So, you know, whether you actually know that 30 was included or not, you'd have still done the exact same thing, okay? So I think we should do part B here because this is the one where we're between. Instead of going back to the monsoon range, we'll do the between here out of this one, all right? So in 3.212B, now we're in part B. Yeah, I understand that. You're still looking at the same normal distribution. Mean was 25.3. Standard deviation was 6.5. All right, we're still looking at MCAT test scores. It says what proportion of students had scores between 20 and 25? So how does that get translated? P's proportion or percentage. You want X between two things here, right? You want X between 20 and 25. Now, there's two values of the variable you're interested in. You want the percentage proportion between them. Take it easy, man. Uh, see ya. Okay. All right? Things work exactly the same. Draw my picture. The mean is 25.3. The only difference this time is, is that there are two values that you're interested in. You've got to put them both on your picture. So here's going to set 20, and here's going to set your 25. Email. Just like before, I draw lines down to those values. And then I need to shade what area am I looking for. Well, you understand we're looking between 20 and 25, so I want that. There's two values of the variable you're interested in. You're interested between 20 and 25. There's going to be two z-scores, right? One for each one. So when we standardize, we'll start with the 20. We'll take the 20, subtract off the mean, divide by your standard deviation, I'm expecting a negative z-score since 20 is less than the mean. 
negative point. Marcus? What was it, 8-1 what? Okay. Right, so that's for 20. That's telling you that 20 is 0.82 standard deviations to the left are smaller than the mean. We've got to do the same thing for 25. We subtract 25, we subtract off our mean. We divide by our standard deviation. Again, that's going to be negative, but that's going to be very small. 0.2. Three what? So there's two z-scores that we had to work with here. Now, soon, at this stage, as soon as you do the z-scores, we're going to the standard normal. I like to label it for you. The mean is zero. There's two z-scores because there's two values of the variable. You've got negative 0.82, and you've got negative 0.05, and you want the area between those two. Now, here's the thing, all right, with this type of problem. You can't look up on table A the area between two z-scores. The table A only tells you the area to the left of whatever z-score you're looking up. So here's my question. If I could find the area to the left of that one, that area, and if I could find the area to the left of that one, you understand if I subtract the one on the bottom from the one on the top, then I got the area that I'm looking for. I didn't say this was the only way to do this problem. I said this is a way to do this problem, right? So you've got to use table A, but you've got to use it twice. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take table A. I'm going to go to the row that is minus 0 0.8, the column that is 0 0.02. In other words, I'm interested in that negative 0.82. The row is negative 0 0.8. And the column is 0 0.02. When you look that up, what did we get there? 0 0.2061. And then we're going to go and do the other one. You're going to be in the row. Now, be careful here. It's negative 0, 0.0 row. The column is 0 0.05. Hang on. Right? So that is going to tell me it's the area to the left of that one, and that's going to be 0 0.4, 3085. Now, what I just found was this. Uh, you see I got those red arrows. This one here is 0 0.2061, and this one here is 0 0.3085. If I want what's between those two, the way to do this, and what I want there in blue is I'm going to take the point. 3085, and I'm going to subtract off the point 2061. I get point 1024. That means this right here is. Point one zero two four. If that is point one zero two four, look, you got to understand at this point your answer's there. You're done, right? Because whatever's under the standard normal matches up with the one that was given to us. That's what that standardizing calculating these z scores does. So that means this one is point one zero two four. That means this is. The problem was asking for proportion, so it's 0 0.1024. Okay. Now, that's the three types of problems here. A value you want to the left, a value you want to the right, two values, and you want between. Now, here's the thing. I'm not giving you any homework problems to do tonight, but, you know, I'm going to give you some on Thursday, and they're going to be about these kind of things. Okay. When I see this problem, what I, if you were doing it, I don't expect you to draw the picture. You can do the problem without drawing the picture. But you've got to have this part. You at least got to know what you're looking for and what you're doing, right? Are you looking for proportion between whatever? You've got to do... Surely the hell you had to calculate Z-score or Z-scores. And then... 
surely you had to run the table A and then do the subtraction there. That's what I expect to see out of you. I don't expect to see pictures. It's okay. I draw the pictures because it helps me keep track of things. And it helps me show you exactly what we're looking at there. Right? So, hmm? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying you can't draw them. You can draw them, right? But I'm just saying, you know, when I start grading it, what I'm looking at is, did you give me the question that was asked? Do I see where you calculated some z-scores? And did I see that, you know, did you subtract from one? Did you just give me the number you looked up? Did you go between them? That's what I expect to see. The pictures are, you can draw them. There's no problem. But I don't grade on whether you give me the picture or not. Okay? Now, Uh, I'm not done working problems. Hey, look, at any point that you feel like I've worked too many problems, I'm sorry. Okay? You can't have me work. It feels like a math class tonight in case you didn't know, right? Because I wrote way more numbers and symbols and all that crap than I wrote words tonight, right? So it feels like a math class all of a sudden, okay? So there's one other type of problem here. Now, you, I don't know how close you pay attention to the words I say because I say a lot of words, right? But you notice with these three types of problems, I gave you a value, the variable, you gave me to the left, to the right, or I gave you two values and you gave me between, right? So all three of these, what they have in common is they were giving you values of the variable and they were asking you about percentages to the left, to the right, or between, or proportions, whichever way the question was worded, right? So now there's a fourth type of problem, finding a value of the variable given a proportion. Look, I added words from what the book's doing. In other words, you're going to work backwards here. You're not given a value of the variable. What you're given is a proportion or a percentage, and then you're asked to produce the value of the variable that has that to its left or it's to its right. Okay? So when I see this kind of thought here, what I want to think about is I want to work backwards. from the problems I've been doing before, right? Because before it was a value, you gave me the percentage of proportion. Now, they're going to give you a percentage of proportion, and you've got to give me back the value of the variable, okay? Now, I don't want to do the one that they're doing in the example 3.9. I'm going to come to your homework problems over here. Uh, I'm all the way at the end here, your exercises. And what I want to look at is 3.36, and I'm on page 96. Okay. So all these problems, like 3.35 through 3.38, they're all about miles per gallon. It's written there in the bottom of page 96. It says, in its fuel economy guide, fuel economy guide for 2014 motor vehicles, the EPA gives data on 1,160 vehicles. There are a number of high outliers, many hybrid gas electric vehicles. If we ignore the vehicles identified as outliers, however, the combined city and highway gas mileage for the other of the other 1,134 vehicles is approximately normal with a mean of 22.2 and a standard deviation of 5.2. So now you're looking at combined city and highway gas mileage of 1,134 vehicles, right? You threw out the outliers. They turn out they follow a normal distribution. They have a mean of 22.2 and a standard deviation of 5.2 miles per gallon for both of these. Okay? Now... 336 says the following. How high must a 2014 vehicle's gas mileage be to fall in the top 5% of all vehicles? Now, before we try to do anything here, you understand they didn't give me a miles per gallon and ask you for percentages. They gave you a percentage and asked you for a miles per gallon, right? So this problem says you want to know, look, it's like this. 
There's your normal distribution. At some point here, there's 5% there, right? There's some amount of area that's 5% of the area to the right. So you want the top 5%. Now, what's 5% here? Is that true? You understand why I wrote it decimal in four, right? How's everything in table A given to me? It's a decimal in four. So 5% is 0 .0500. Now, we're going to work backwards. We're going to start with the standard normal. The mean is zero. Now, I'm going to do this. You understand there's a z-score somewhere that this area here is point zero five zero zero. Agreed? There's got to be some z-score that has 5% of the area to its right. Okay? Now, can I run to the table and look up point zero five zero zero in the middle? No, no. It's always, he's shaking his head at me, it's always to the left, right? So, to the left must be, yeah? Remember, you take 0 0.0500, you subtract from 1. To the left must be 0 0.9500. Now, here's the thing. Again, my language I use. All the problems up till now, you had a z-score. You found the row, you found the column, and then you read to the inside, right? So you read from outside to inside. Now, you have an area. So now you have to read from inside out. When you're done, you need to have a z-score here, yes? So you're going to read. Remember, this is a number you're looking at. This is a number you're trying to find in table A. Okay? So you're in table A. You're reading the inside of the table. And you're trying to find, you're not going to find it exactly. You're trying to find the closest that you can find to 0 0.9500. Is my z score going to be positive or negative? I can cut the table in half for you. The z-score is going to have to be positive here, right, because you're to the right of the mean, 5% that way. So you start looking. Now, I'm going to think that you're going to find numbers like, uh, I can't remember. You're going to find two in the table. 0 0.9500 is going to be between two of them. If I'm looking here for 0 0.9500, the closest I'm going to get is 0.9495. And 0 0.9505. Yep. Pick either one. I don't care. Aren't they the same distance away? Yeah. So I'm going to pick what I found was 0 0.9495. You could have used the other one. You always pick the one that's closest. They're both the same distance away. So what row am I in? Well, when I find 0 0.9495, everybody see I'm in the 1.6 row? What column am I in? I don't know. You read up, and I'm in the 0 0.04 column. That gives me a z-score of 1.64. Remember, the column tells you the 100 spot. The row tells you the 1 spot and the 10 spot. I didn't add or subtract. I just said, okay, this is how my number's laid out here by place value. Now, when I'm working forwards, where did the z-score come? It came from your little z-score, right? So, I got a z-score for me that looks like this. Except this time, you know the z-score. The thing you don't know is the x. So I know, plugging in, I got 1.64 is equal to x minus 22.2 divided by 5.2. You're trying to solve for x, folks. Remember, that would be a value of the variable. So just so you know what we're doing, we're going to solve for When I do that, I'm going to multiply both sides by 
I'm going to add 22.2 to both sides. And then somebody going to get out the calculator. You're going to take 1.64 times 5.2, add that to 22.2, and you're going to give me the x. You're going to give me the value of the variable. My friend says 30.73. That's a miles per gallon, right, that you found. See, 30.73, I'm not going to draw the last picture like I would work it all the way backwards. You know, so if I go back to my, maybe I will, just to show you what we just did there. This is this normal distribution. Means 22.2. You just found 30.73. That's the one that has 5% of the area to its right. That's what you found. Okay? So my answer here is, what does it say? The question says, how high must the 2014 vehicle's gas mileage be to fall in the top 5% of all vehicles? 30.73 miles per gallon or higher. Right, because if you're at 30.73 or higher, you will be to the right and you will be in that top 5%. Now, I chose to do the problem that was, I mean, I think it's a little more difficult. What about if I said the bottom 5%? Can we do the bottom 5%? So you got the same thing, right? So now I want to know, okay, what miles per gallon will put you in the bottom 5%? Okay, the only difference is, Again, I'm making up a problem here for you, so I can show you this. The bottom, 5%. It's still the same miles per gallon, city combined city and highway, 22.2, 5.2. We start with the standard normal. The mean is zero. You have to understand that there's going to be a Z here. Right, I mean, the bottom 5% is going to be down there. Okay. Now, do I have to do any of that subtracting from 1, or can I look that up in the table? I can actually look that up in the table now, right? So I'm going to table A. I'm interested in this point 0500. You will fall between two of them. I'm guessing you're going to fall between 0 0.0505 and 0 0.0495. Just guessing. You understand your z-score is going to be negative this time, so I'm looking up 0 0.0500, and I find 0 0.505 and 0 0.0495. They're both the same. Pick one. This time I'll pick the 0 0.0505. And then the question is, is what row are you in? What column are you in? Well, you're in the row that's minus 1.6. You're in the column that is 0.04. When I stick that together, my z-score is negative 1.64. Not adding or subtracting, it's just I know where the place values are. Then, there's your z-score that has 5% of the area to its left. Okay? So, I need to use this guy and work backwards. So, you're going to get here. I've got the z-score minus 1.64 is equal to x minus your mean over your standard deviation. Again, we're going to solve for x. When I do that, multiply both sides by 5.2. Add 22.2 to both sides.
What was it? 13.67. So 13.67 will have 5% of the area to its left. So what do I need here? I need 13.67 miles per gallon or lower would put you in the bottom 5%. Now, it turns out that if you take one like this, okay, you take these combined city highway. Look, all I need is a normal distribution. I got to ask you a question. What is the median? What's the value of the median there? In that normal distribution that has a mean of 22.2, what value has 50% of the observation smaller and 50% larger? If it's a normal distribution, the mean and the median are equal. So if the mean is 22.2, the median is 22.2. Any of these ones we've looked at here today. If somebody asks you for the median, well, hell, that's the mean, right? That, that's what happens in a symmetric density curve. I've got to ask one more. What is the first quartile? And what I mean is, is what value is the first quartile? My question is, when I ask you for the value of the first quartile, what is the first quartile? Am I giving you a percentage? We're giving you the bottom 25%, right? So here, it may not say it, but we're looking at the bottom 25%. If somebody asks you, for what's the value of the third quartile? That's the bottom. There's 75% to the left, yeah? So they may not actually give you the percentage, but they could ask you for the quartiles here. Well, they are giving you a percentage when they ask you for the quartiles, all right? How would we do this part here about what is the first quartile? Well, you understand we're working backwards. Standard normal. Mean is zero. You need the area to the left of that z-score being 25% because you're looking for the value of the first quartile. You go to table A. When you go to table A, okay, when you go to table A, you're looking up 0.25. You're reading the table inside out. What's the two things you find here? I can't remember. So I'm looking for 0.25. I'm going to find uh, 0.25. Point, uh, 2483, right? I find two values that's between 0. 0.2483 and 0. 0.2515, 14. Which one's closer? The 0. 0.2514, I always pick the closer. I don't care if it's bigger or smaller. What row are you in and what column are you in? You're in the 0. 0.06, excuse me, the 0. 0.6 row. And the, excuse me, minus, and then 0.07 column, right? So that gives me a z score of minus 0 0.67. You just work backwards from there, right? You use your little z score formula and you'll find the value of the first quartile. So you're going to get your homeworks back.
be careful. We will see you on Thursday. As far as I'm concerned, I'm ready to start the next one. I've shown you every type of problem I can think of out of this part here. Just be careful going to the house. Get your homework back.